about you this morning, but I know I've been guilty of taking the patience of God for granted. Have you ever done that? Just thought to yourself, you know what? I know that God is long-suffering, but I'm really taking advantage of how patient he is. And uh, that song, so, so, such a good reminder. It's your kindness, O God, that leads us to repentance. Amen? Good to be with you. Good to see you. Turn to Genesis chapter 1. Uh, Ryan, we have that slide from last week, right? All right, let's throw it up again. We need, we need, a, we need to keep things all in perspective this morning. And uh, so we have, we have the men represented at the top with one toggle switch. And then we got the women on the bottom represented by all sorts of knobs and buttons. And um, a picture is worth a thousand words, yes? We, uh, we talked about guys last week, and um, it, it, we're, we're not as simple as we, we think we are. We talked about the six stages of biblical masculinity, and uh, I tell you what, we hit upon some important, important topics last week, especially in light of, of current debates and issues, especially with the whole Florida school shooting situation, where the media continues to push this idea that it's about gun control. It is not about gun control. I, I'm, not, I'm not against maybe stricter laws. But if we're going to make that the issue, we're missing out on the greater issue, and that is the fact that we live in a culture. Now I'm getting on my soapbox right off the bat. Here we go. We live in a culture that doesn't value life. And if we don't protect the life of the unborn and we don't respect the life of the elderly, hence abortion and euthanasia, why in the heck are we exposed to expect our kids to understand the value of life when we're so quick to dismiss it? And then we talked about the home, right? The family breakdown, right? And there's situations there that need to be better and improved. And again, we want to make the issue about gun control. It's not. It's about how we are raising our kids and what values we're passing on to them. And I'm going to post some articles this week on the Missio Day page on Facebook uh, that have been written in light of the masculinity crisis in our country. And they frame the conversation in such a way that will put it in perspective. I touched upon it last week. But we need to pray for our country. Amen. We need to pray for our, our boys and our men that are growing up with understanding all the things that are just wrong to embrace and wrong to value. And I hope last week we did somewhat of a, of a justice to the word of God and, and the stages of masculinity and the words that are used in the Bible for man. They're different. And the same thing is true for women. There's six stages of biblical femininity that we're going to look at this morning. Uh, so date day Friday, right? So what, what romantic movie did I take my wife to go see? We went and saw the movie Annihilation with Natalie Portman. Who saw it? Okay, I'm going to tell you right now. I haven't felt so moved by a movie since I saw Arrival two years ago. Arrival was my favorite movie of 2016. What was unique about Arrival was this idea that these aliens landed, right? And they've been doing all they could to connect with this, this other species from somewhere out in the, the, the cosmos. And what do they do? They hire a female linguistics expert to come in and connect with this other being. And the movie was a marvel because what it did is Hollywood showed us that there are differences when it comes to gender, and how we're wired, and the character that Amy Adams played in Arrival was able to do something none of the other men were able to do. And she built bridges. What was that? Communicate. Yeah, we're going to touch on that this morning. And I'm sitting there going, wow, this is fat. So Arrival is my favorite. This right now, Annihilation, it's, 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 it's got some gory parts. It's, there's some bloody moments. But here's the premise. There's this alien force that's landed on Earth, and it's taking over the Earth. And a group of five women go into this thing called the Shimmer to try to make sense of this alien presence. And in the movie, the conversations between the women are, why do you think we are together as this group of women going into this unknown environment when the men before us have failed to bring anything substantive back. 
And so now we have this journey of, this, of, the, of the feminine creature we call woman going into the shimmer and why they're going in, why each person has signed up to do this and the connections they've made and perhaps what this alien force is trying to teach us even about our own humanity is brilliant. What's billed as a sci-fi movie from the previews goes much more deeper into what it means to be humanity, and especially male and female. Now, we live in a culture that wants to tell you that there's no differences between the sexes. We, we live in a culture that's saying we're just going to be all pressed into one, one gender mix, and we're trying to churn out this androgynous person we call human, but God has never created us just to exist as one human. We're, we exist as two humans, male and female. That's our humanness. And what the culture doesn't understand, and yet it, it's grasping at, right? Movies, look at this. It, it does acknowledge that there is a difference between the two. But this is something that God's been trying to teach us for so long. That there is a difference between males and females. And I would not do you justice as a church community, as those who love God and fear Christ and want to grow, if I ignored what God has clearly set up in his scriptures. There are different words for man that represent different stages in the male journey, and there are different uh, words for women that God has given us to let us know that the feminine journey is also important, but yet it looks different than the male journey. So these are teaching moments for us. I had several women from last week tell me, thank you for helping me understand the male journey. And today, we get to understand the feminine journey. Now, granted, I'm not a female. As far as you guys know, I'm not a female, right? I'm very male, and there are aspects of, the, of, of, of women that I have grown to understand and appreciate, and yet there's some things that I don't understand. And so these, these notes, these points have been thoroughly uh, cross-checked by my wife, because that was the other part of date day on Friday. She is here as a sounding board and also to lend feedback and she's allowed to say, time out, can you re-explain that? Because you don't necessarily understand what you just said, being a male. Let me add a little light to that. And so, um, six stages of biblical femininity. Here we go. The one stage that's shared with the male counterpart is this, creational woman or creational female. Again, last week we talked about what it means to be created in the image of God. In his image we have been created. In his likeness we have been created. Male and female, clearly Genesis chapter 1. Turn your Bibles there as a reminder, chapter 1, verse 26, 27. Clearly distinct in our design. And yet, here's the word that we cannot miss out on, complementary. See, we are able together to best reflect the image of God than we could do separately. That there is a designed by God, given to men and women, that when we come together, we best reflect the image of God. Now, notice last week, we did very little conversation about marriage. This has nothing to do with being married or not being married. This, this message is for single men and single women, as well as married men and married women. Matter of fact, all of these points have nothing to do with marital status. None of these points have anything to do with whether you have children or however many children you have. These points are true for you simply because you are born into this world created in the image of God. And we would do well to walk in the wisdom of God and how he's mapped out our gender differences. And yet, creational female, there's three things we need to consider in this conversation. Number one, that woman is a, she is a woman of dignity. Number two, she is a woman of responsibility. And number three, she is a woman of vulnerability. Now, what we see in Genesis are these three things clearly laid out for us. Number one, she has dignity simply because she is created in the image of God. And what I know for women, this is a tough place to arrive at because so many times women find value in their relationships, in their marriage, with their children, in their friendships. And it is easy to have that dignity destroyed or diminished if we don't get to the heart of the fact that simply because she is, she has worth and significance. Amen? Self-esteem 
for a woman is not something to be sought. It is something to be discovered. This is how God has wired us. That you have dignity simply because you exist. There is intrinsic dignity and worth rooted simply because you're uniquely created by God. Woman of responsibility. But notice that men and women are equal. They are co-equal in Genesis chapter 1 in that they are both commissioned to do two things. Reproduce and rule. Both to the male and the female, Adam and Eve, God clearly says to them, be fruitful and multiply and have dominion over what I have created. Woman shares in the responsibility with men to take care of what God has entrusted to them. Two things, reproduction and rule. Now what's amazing is that the woman's body has been designed differently than the man's body in this role, specifically with reproduction. See, we have to realize that when God has created us, he has created us so that we are anatomically different, and yet in that difference we fit together like a puzzle piece. And he has designed us that way for the ultimate purpose to fill the earth, multiply and fill the earth earth and so there's an intrinsic responsibility hardwired in all of us as male and female now with the i'm going to tell you right now that probably one of the greatest things that has damaged the woman's identity over these past several decades is the pro-choice movement the the pro-choice movement came out of the women's feminist voice of the 60s and the 70s, spearheaded by such female leaders as Gloria Steinem, etc., that basically said that, you know what, women ought to have the same rights, same privileges, and pursue the same things that men pursue and have. And so all of a sudden there came this burgeoning effort to encourage women to get out of the house, get away from being uh, wives and mothers, and just get out there and do all the things that men do. And I'm going to tell you that this has come at a great cost to damage the dignity of women, and we're going to talk about more of this here in a moment. But the pro-choice movement specifically, when you begin to attack the very ways you are designed by God and try to remove this element of mothering and reproduction and nurturing and things like that, it does nothing but damage the woman's psyche and her dignity by design. And we're going to talk more about that here in a moment, which then leads us to our third point is the vulnerability. That in Genesis, with the garden that God has designed and set woman in and man in, he has given them everything that they needed for life. And yet what we see, and we're going to unpack as we get to Genesis 2 and 3 later, is that notice when the serpent came into the garden, who did he go to in order to get them to eat the fruit that they were commanded not to eat from? The woman. Now, this doesn't mean the woman's weaker, because what this actually shows is man's shirking his responsibility to be involved in the life of the garden and specifically to co-lead with his wife in reproducing and ruling. He shirks his responsibility. The serpent then comes to Eve, and what does he do? He sows seeds of, don't miss this word, dissatisfaction in her. This is where women are generally most vulnerable this is why i'm sitting in great clips because i spent a lot of money to get my hair cut i sit in a great clips and i pick up a women's magazine just to go what's the other what's the other sex thinking these days right and i'm flipping through a magazine there's no articles there's no articles why it's all ads because women's magazines are designed to sow seeds of dissatisfaction because it's showing you what you don't have and it it creates for you a longing to have what you don't have, which in sense means you're dissatisfied. 
I go on vacation with my family so we can watch cable TV. You guys know the story of why we vacation. We don't have cable at home. But the danger is always this. The moment my wife starts watching HGTV, which is of the devil. I'm going to tell you right now. Like, <laughs> she'll watch a show for a half hour, and, and all of a sudden she wants to go home and redo our entire house. And I'm going, what? <laughs> I thought you were happy. I, I thought, you know, nope. I don't like our kitchen cabinets the way they are. And, you know, we got to do something with our backyard because it is a mess. And all of a sudden, my wife is on this HTGTV streak, and I'm like, what's going on? <laughs> right? Yeah, the honeydew list after vacation multiplies times 10, right? But it's something intriguing that the, the serpent was crafty enough to take advantage of this way that a woman's been designed. And this vulnerability is something that leverages a woman to find that satisfaction, not in the things she possesses, but in the God who possesses her. Okay, that's the key here. I mean, this is exactly what 1 John talked about in chapter 2. If you remember 1 John, we went through the whole letter. He says, don't love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life. See, it seems like men struggle in these areas, but also women, especially when it comes to the, the, the desires of the eyes. If, if the enemy can only parade these things in front of a woman, he will continue to sow the dissatisfaction that exists within. There's that, that area of vulnerability when si w inside a woman. And this is something to be seized in Jesus Christ. Amen? So, creational woman, three things to look at when it comes to, to Genesis. Uh, just like I gave you last week, biblical characters to, to kind of maybe emphasize some of these points. Eve, Eve, the mother of humanity, right, who was set up in the garden. You can read about her account in Genesis 1, 2, 3, and we're going to unpack this more in the weeks to come. Number two stage for the woman. This is now where the roads diverge, and it becomes an entirely different journey than that of the male counterpart. And that is the young woman. The young woman, you can also put the, the beautiful woman. This is the woman in her youthfulness. This is the woman that is growing into her, her beauty. This is something that the biblical writers understand clearly that God says, I have designed woman with a very unique outer beauty. And the question is this, how does a woman use not only the beauty, but the energy, energy they've been given in positive ways. I think we would all agree that we see a culture that has used the young woman's energy and beauty in wrong ways. And the Bible is very clear, and this is why he's created woman differently, not male, but female, that her sexual uniqueness is a source of attraction and power, and that's not wrong. It's when we live in a culture that makes beauty, the external beauty, the main obsession and the thing to really focus on. Because here's the reality, points in your notes, a young woman's beauty can be used in purity and innocent pleasure or idolatry and deceit. I'm going to tell you right now, ladies, I feel for you. When you are bombarded with images, when you have this parade of illusions before you, as you consider the women that are out there that tend to be showcased, whether in magazines, whether on TV, whether on your Instagram or Twitter feed or whatever. I mean, seriously, I have a daughter who has a smartphone, and she looks at this stuff, and I sit there and go, I want to protect you because that's only going to sow this seed of I'm not like this. And so what is the, the problem is that Proverbs 31, incredible ver verse, verse 30 says this, charm is deceitful. Beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. The Bible doesn't say don't take care of yourself physically. It doesn't say that. What it says is don't take care of yourself physically that you neglect internally the beauty that God has given you because you're simply created in the image of God. See, even the woman of Proverbs 31, which we're going to come back to again, she will tell you that charm is deceitful and beauty is 
is vain. See, youth has a tendency to focus on the blemishes, the flaws, the scars, the birthmarks, the differences, viewing them as imperfections rather than those elements that make us unique expressions of God's creativity. This is why self-esteem is so tenuous in a young woman's heart because if she continues to listen to the voice of the culture, it does nothing but fuel the insecurities and fears that dwell within. We have a, 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 a culture that's obsessed with thinness. And I'm going to tell you right now that God has designed the feminine body different than the masculine body. One of the things I was looking at, because I got to study, you know, some of these topics this week and look at them. And one of the things I discovered is that fat for a woman is vitally important to her body and how it functions. Women have an average 8% more body fat as compared to men for a reason. Fat tissues regulate hormone balance necessary for reproduction, good health, and sexual desire. And yet we have a culture that runs rampant Basically saying, if you're not thin, you're not important. If you're not thin, you are not going to be appreciated by men or or people in general. Can I tell you what? Go back to 1852, if you would. In a women's magazine in 1852, here's what one of the articles said. It is the woman's business to be beautiful. This is... How long ago? 18, do the math. That's a long time ago, right? Like, this is nothing new. See, women in their youthfulness, with their beauty and their energy, have been battling cultural mores for a long time when it comes to the things that cultures value. Culture parades these illusions before young, young women, and it does nothing but sow seeds of discontent. Go back to, so during the time of the New Testament writers, there were these temples that were set up in in greek and in roman times where there were gods and goddesses put up as as statues as monuments one of the unique statues was a statue by the name of aphrodite one of the goddesses she's the only female goddess that's portrayed naked because what aphrodite did in the culture was it basically showed every woman what she was to attain to So Aphrodite was the poster child of femininity. And she's the only one that's basically uh, portrayed naked so that women knew what to aspire to. Now what you do is you understand that culture and say, okay, here are the images given to the culture. Now what you need to consider are the temple prostitutes that were now present in that time that not only took the sexual fantasy and playing on their beauty, but now combining it with religious worship because a man went to the temple to meet this young, beautiful woman to not only engage in the act of sexual intercourse with her, but also she, before the sexual act, would pray to her gods and use the sex act as an opportunity to worship the gods she worshipped. So now what you have is the combining of sexuality with spirituality. We talked about this last last week with the men you can't separate the two which means a woman's sexuality is a picture of the god she serves the two cannot be separated and we see it going all the way back into greek and roman culture these young beautiful girls that would sleep with these men were really mediators between the sexual fantasy and the spiritual hunger and longing And in the young woman, they found their connection. And yet we haven't really departed from that whole picture today. You know, I grew up in a culture where some of my friends had pictures of women up in their bedroom. Those classic, remember back, I'm going back, Farrah Fawcett. Right? (laughs) There's a reason why men have these pictures. Because there's something that, in empowers them which is a good thing the sexual desire right but there it's a it's it's also a form of idolatry and this is why it's so insidious right like oh wow she's beautiful and all of a sudden now you entertain these images and it does something within the masculine soul and now when the masculine soul wants that we have a culture that now just says yeah ladies 
the more attractive you look, the more you take care of yourself, the thinner you are, you know, the more the men, and, and all of a sudden it's just one sickness feeding upon another. And we have to be careful. Daniel Crittenden wrote a book called What Our Mothers Didn't Tell Us what ha- When Happiness uh, Eludes the Modern Woman. Listen to what she said. Indeed, in all the promises made to us about our ability to achieve freedom and independence as a woman, the promise of sexual emancipation may have been the most illusory. These days, certainly, it is one of the most brutally learned. All the sexual bravado a girl may possess evaporates the first time a boy she truly cares for, makes it clear that he has no further use for her after his own body has been satisfied. No amount of feminist posturing, no amount of reassurances that she doesn't need a guy like that anyway can protect her from the pain and humiliation of those awful moments after he's gone when she's alone and feeling not sexually empowered but discarded. It doesn't take most women long to figure out that sexual liberty is not the same thing as sexual equality. My heart breaks. My heart breaks. Because we have a culture that understands that beauty for women is, is, is not about morality. It's, it's about power. And there can be good uses and there can be horrible misuses of this thing. That's why it's danger when we have a, a thing on the TV called the Miss America pageant. Right? What are we doing for our young girls today? And, and you know what? You can add all the talent portion. Right? You can add all the other. In the end, you know what? We have a culture that basically says sin is in. I'm in the grocery store the other day with my y- littlest child, Hudson, nine years old. And uh, it's become quite an adventure when you're in the checkout lane because they still have the magazine racks right there. And my kids will, like, they'll tug on me, and they'll be like, and there's a woman there with, you know, cleavage on the magazine. And I'm like, I mean, it's a beautiful thing, but I'm glad you're, you're sensitive to that. I don't want to, like, totally poo-poo on that. Like, I want my kids to, l- t- to love the feminine physique, but to remind them that that's not all there is, right? But then he looks, and he sees a picture of John Benet Ramsey. And, you know, this is, this is an event that happened, what, 20, 20 years ago? He's like, Dad, who, who is that? I said, that's a little girl that was, that was murdered. He's like, that's a little girl? She looks like a little doll. And right then, I was like, okay, here in this nine-year-old little brain, he's looking at this little girl. And I forgot how old John Benet Ramsey was, but it's horrible what happened. But what the, the parents, you know, and again, whether you want to get your kids involved in beauty pageants and things like that, but when does a little girl cease to be a little girl? Because of what our culture demands and dictates. And sits there and goes, that, that little girl doesn't look like a little girl. I mean, he's in a class with little girls. He's going, that doesn't look like. And I have to navigate these conversations with him. And say, you know what? doesn't matter what a kid, woman looks like. What matters is the heart, which brings us to. The important point in your notes, number one, the pursuit of spiritual maturity, not beauty, ought to be the woman's primary goal. This is what the Bible espouses, right? Not that we're saying you don't take care of yourself physically, you don't take care of yourself when it comes to how you look, but don't let those pursuits come at expense of what truly matters in the eyes of God. Women are raised to fear being fat more than having a fear of God, and that is wrong. Women... Mature womanhood is often being the perfect six dress size and not believing in Jesus Christ, and that is wrong. Beauty is deceptive. Cosmetic surgery is a billion dollar a year industry. Because again, if I don't look like that, I want to look like that. And, and again, cosmetic surgery, if you've had it, is not the unforgivable sin. Amen? But what we have to stop and say, why do I feel like I need to pursue this? Have I not tapped into the fact that I have intrinsic worth and dignity simply because I'm created as God and I will accept whatever God has given to me as far as my design? And we have to ask ourselves these questions because beauty is deceptive. And yet it's a, it's a divine attribute. 
beauty begins with God. And, and God is beautiful. God is amazing. And yet, what is so deceitful about the work of the enemy is that he is also beautiful. The angel that had been created, Lucifer, is crafty and beautiful. The Bible tells us this, John chapter 8, and in Corinthians, Paul says, be careful because he disguises himself as an angel of light. And sometimes when it comes to those messages, it's hard to discern what is coming from whom. And for the ladies out there, beauty is not in the, only in the eye of the beholder, but is mo- most importantly in the eye of your maker. He sees you as beautiful simply because you exist. And I want you to be careful, you guys, because social media is bombarding you with images. I can tell when my daughter or my wife has been looking at things through social media because it sows those seeds of I'm not satisfied. And I want us to be careful. Two characters to consider. I'm going to give you a a, a negative character and a positive character. The negative character is Salome or uh, Salome. Uh, the woman who did the dance and then ultimately had John the, the Baptist he- beheaded. She used her power and her beauty in a way to kill this man who was a messenger of the kingdom of God. There's a negative example, right? Powerful. Uh, <coughs> be- this beautiful woman used her power. Like in the Greek mythology, right? The, the women that wooed the sailors to crash their ships on the rocks, right? Through their beauty and through their song, right? Pow- beautif- beauty is powerful. Powerful, but it can also be destructive. Positive example, Esther. Look at Esther, the first beauty pageant that was ever held in human history. Awesome. The thing with the book of Esther is that there's no mention of God in, in the book. That's why a lot of people throughout the ages have asked, do we include this in the, in the, in the scriptures? And what's amazing is Esther was taken into captivity She was a Jewish woman who came into a very pagan culture but used her beauty as an opportunity for the deliverance of her people. And there it is, right? How do we use beauty, energy, in a positive way? Consider the words of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Though our bodies are dying, and this is the reality that we all have to face, right? We do not lose heart. Our outer self is wasting away. Our inner self is being renewed day by day. Ladies, Take care of yourselves. We want you to do that, right? Just like you want us guys to take care of ourselves, but not at the expense of the internal component of who we truly are when no one's looking and it's just God saying, well done. You're focusing on on me. Quick, anything you would add? Oh, wow. You have one minute. Oh, who gave her a microphone? Ended. Okay. Okay. Um, I will say I'm laughing because um, it was a man who sculpted Aphrodite, by the way, right? This God who was created, (laughs) God, Mm -hmm. was sculpted by a man. So all these notes I'm taking, I'm like, yes, men and women were created to live in harmony together. But unfortunately, when sin entered the world, the woman now pressed down, now having to prove her worth and her value because of her beauty through her beauty, um, pro-choice movement. I'm sitting here thinking all of those things, abortion would never be if men would just love women the way they should, correct? That and women would love <laughs> women themselves love as they themselves. should, right? It goes and both ways, yeah. And if, if crea- you know, all of those things. I keep thinking we can't just, we can't put a blame on men for everything we'd like to. Yeah, you would like to, huh, ladies? But when I think about the destruction of culture from the beginning, it's because of sin. Yeah. And little girls. Yeah. My little girl loved beauty at a very young age and had no idea what it was. Right. But she loved to comb her little hair. And I think of like little Paisley. Like there's nothing wrong with like right. putting bows and flowers and fairy wings on. Like that is yeah. intrinsic in them. Yeah. It's not sinful. Right. But what happens is when they start to get to be 13, 14, 15, and those pressures come in and boys are, t- are putting the pressure on these girls. If we lived in a Wonder Woman society <laughs> – well, we'd probably figure out a way to screw that up, too. But <laughs> but uh, I'm just saying, like, there's pressure that comes in from yeah. from the male counterpart. Yeah. And, and so we as women need to come alongside the younger women and say, you are beautiful, but yep. let's beauty from yeah. within out, right? Yeah, so to t- tag team with Lori on this, 
women, you have value simply because you are created in the image of God. Okay? L- ladies, you need to hear that. Men, those women have value not because of how they look. They have value simply because they are. Okay? So we, as men, can help the women in our lives by appreciating them not for how they look. And don't be that husband, don't be that boyfriend, don't be that guy who is continually image-shaming women that is doing nothing but feeding the problem that Lori's touching on. Okay? So, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Ladies, stop it. Okay? Jerry, Jerry's nailing it. Yeah. See, you see how this is just not as simple? But yet we can be culture changers, huh? So ladies, Timothy says, older ladies, draw alongside those younger women and invest in them spiritually and show them what's ultimately important. Right, guys? Change your mentality of women. Change your understanding of, of this female counterpart. And again, this has to do more with us being brothers and sisters in Christ who are fellow heirs of the grace of life in him. This has nothing to do with being married or not. I have a responsibility to you ladies as a brother, and you're my sister. So how can I encourage you in the journey? Ladies, you can help one another out in the journey. Amen? Th- number three, nurturing female. Nurturing female. Let me just tell you real quick that, uh, you know, Psalm 139 is such a great passage because here the psalmist says, For you formed me, God, in my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. What we have to understand again is the anatomical difference between male and female. Woman literally means womb, man. The, the one who's created in the image of God, but yet distinct from male because you possess this thing called a womb that a man does not have. And now the womb becomes a place of nourishing and nurturing. This is something that is at the core of every woman brought into this world. Two points. Number one, a woman has a special influence in our world, not only through childbearing and motherhood, but in all her relationships and work. When I speak of nurturing and nourishing, we are not just talking about whether she's married or a mom. Nurturing components come out in all of her relationships and in her work. And we want to make sure we press that point home. But secondly, the nurturing instinct seems to be at the core of a woman's being. This is why when movies came out like in the 80s, two of them I can think of, Mr. Mom and Three Men and a Baby. Culture was like, <laughs> right? Look what happens when men are left in try- trying to be nurturers. It's a train wreck. Right, you remember the scene from Three Men and a Baby? They're trying to drive the baby over the, the air thing in the bathroom, and it's just it's not going well. And Michael Keaton, Mr. Mom, not knowing what to do with the, the dishes. and this, You know, it was just that, that way the culture at that time said, look how men and women are different. Men, by nature, are not nurturers. And so when God says to man and woman, be fruitful and multiply, he's basically saying that you're both going to play an active role in the childbearing event, but the woman is going to play a very important role because there is this natural nourishing relationship that begins to develop in the womb. She gets nine months with this life growing inside of her, and all of a sudden there is the nurturing instincts that are there hardwired into this. And now once that child is now born, there's already been a relationship established. We as guys get to just jump in at the start of this, but she's already been journeying with this child for nine months. And there's something wonderful that is happening. These instincts of nourishing and caring go along with the reproductive territory. And so what we have to understand is women can do one thing that men can never do, and that is have a baby grow inside their belly. And even Disney, my kids love Phineas and Ferb. So it's a Disney cartoon, and I love Phineas and Ferb too. And so basically the premise of Phineas and Ferb, if you've never uh, heard of it, it's what do these kids do during the summer? And they come up with all these outlandish ideas, right? Well, there's this one episode where Dr. Doofenshmirtz, he's kind of the evil villain in the show, 
he creates this machine that basically sends out a baby's cry over the city so that everyone hears it. And as soon as he sounds the baby's cry, it's interesting, in the cartoon, every mother in the city all of a sudden goes, and they all start marching down the street because they hear a baby crying, and they all come together to take care of the baby crying. Disney gets it. It's saying that there is something part of a woman's design when it comes to a nurturing woman that when you hear a baby cry, it sets you off unlike what it does to a man, and a man just ignores it, right? When, when, when we had babies, you know, I pretended I didn't hear the baby crying so I didn't have to get up in the middle of the night and lose my sleep, right? But it would drive Lori crazy, right? Because this is part of who she is. And again, what the feminist liberation movement has done is it created this this model of woman that is not woman. And I'm not saying women don't go into the workforce and don't join the military, this and that. But what it's done is it said, ladies, you need to become more empowered. You can do all the things a man can do. So what happened then is that this feminist movement took place, 60s, 70s, and we see women entering the workforce and women entering the military. 20 years after the first feminine, feminine voices spoke out, there was this return now of women to the home. Because they basically said, and research proves this, that while we thought we, th- we, we knew what we wanted, everything that a man wanted, we became deeply dissatisfied with those things because that's not who I am. And more and more women who embrace the feminist philosophy have now returned to the place where they feel much more naturally connected. So, for a woman to try to be more like a man seems almost by definition to make her a less happy woman. Really, think about this. In order for her to become like a man, which is the message of the feminist movement, she becomes less and less like one. Let me read for you something. Feminine glory is suited only for a woman. Not because men and women have nothing in common. We have everything in common. As bone of the same bone, bone, flesh of the same flesh. But because of our sameness only makes sense in light of the triune God who is distinct in three persons. Listen to this. When we forsake our feminine glory, this is from a female writer, when we forsake our feminine glory in pursuit of the uniqueness that belongs to men, we abandon our God-given glory. We become usurpers, persistently insisting that our uterus and biology are equal to nothing irrelevant. Women believe the lie that in order to be relevant in a man's world, you become like a man when the opposite is true. So women approach life as nurturers i am so grateful for a wife a mother that is a nurturer in all capacities of her life my wife she's she's a rock star like when i think of rock star i think of here's this woman who's not only my wife she is my children's mother she's a teacher she helps run the business here at the coffee shop she is like a sound person for local bands here on she has women's bible study i mean i sit there and go where do you find the time to do all this stuff and i sit there and what i appreciate is she brings that nurturing component to all those relationships we do not just think of a nurturer as a woman only in regard to her marriage and her kids she is a nurturer everywhere she goes because what does a nurturer do a nurturer brings life that's what the name eve means eve literally means life giver She is a life giver, and every woman who has come from Eve follows that design. So they are life givers. And again, this has nothing to do whether you're married. This has nothing to do whether you have kids, because you have this influence, or you can have this influence, everywhere you go. And I'm going to tell you right now that the influence that a woman has on shaping the character of her kids is tantamount. Back to our societal ills. The breakdown of the home. And Churchill was right. When decades ago he said the hand that rocks 
the cradle rules the world. Churchill knew that power did not exist with armies. Power did not exist with parliament. Power exists first and foremost in the home. And the greatest influences that are felt in this world come from mom and dad. Amen? Consider the biblical character Mary, mother of Jesus. Now, who wants that job, right? So here's a nurturer. What you see is Mary accepting the, the news that she is pregnant when a culture that would often just stigmatize maybe someone like that 2,000 years ago. She gives birth to this child. She's concerned about his well-being. Luke 2 says he grows in fullness and stature and wisdom. And so you see the effects of the, the nurturing mother. I wish we had more of a picture of how Mary mothered Jesus. She's concerned about his well-being. Remember, he disappears in the temple, and they're frantic because they can't find him. And, and yet she nurtures him, and then ultimately, too, she even nurtures him because we see him on the cross doing what he came to do, and she's weeping there. And you almost see a reversal of nurturing from the Son of God, Jesus himself, where he commissions John to take care of his mom. Right? Like, this is not saying that man can't be nurtured, right? Because Jesus is there looking at his own mother saying, take care of her. But for a woman like Mary to know that she is designed to invest in her child's life, but the pain of nurturing comes at the, at the expense of realizing that there comes a point you've got to let go. And she had to let go of her son. And so Mary provides this incredible picture of what it means to, to be a nur nurturer. Number four. A, a quick thought. Do you have one? You good? Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, no. He's got the mic. Look out. Clarification for, because I know there's some stay-at-home dads in this room. Yeah. You're not saying that that can't be done. You're, you're saying that maybe long term, it's not ideal, but don't just dads stay home and take care of their kids. I'm not going to say it can't happen. I'm going to say it just becomes a more difficult journey for the man to do that than for the woman. Can be. Yeah. So, you good? Oh, I love, you know, I love comments like that. Short and quick, right? Number four, relational woman. We're going to spend uh, just a, a good amount of time here. I'm going to try to be sensitive to the clock again because there's so much here. Proverbs 14.1 says this. The wisest of women builds her house, but folly with her own hands tears it down. Woman has des been designed for relationship. That's what the Proverbs is telling us. Unique picture here of woman who builds a house. And this is not just the house where she lives. The idea here is that a woman is in relationship uh, to help make her environment better. She has that influence, and the influence comes by means of relationship. Great example. This week, Lori told me, uh, of the situation in her class, and I, st I thought to myself, I'm going to share it with the church on Sunday. With her permission, uh, can you, you just share it? She's better at sharing it than I am. She was there. Listen to this, and I'm going to tell you how relationally different we are as men and women. Okay, so as a music teacher, I had a class who was third graders, it was Hudson's class, and I had an activity, a sheet, like to find the notes on the page or whatever, the music notes. Give 20 kids all the sheet. I said, now I want you to partner up Partner up quick and work on it together. The boys immediately partnered with someone and got started on the activity. The group of girls all sat there. They were like, who's going to, do you want to be my partner? Do you want to, she wants to be my partner, but she wants to be my partner. They were frozen in their relational connectivity, what, connectivity because they didn't want to hurt her feelings. And she wants to be my partner, but she wants it. They literally were frozen. Yeah. Because of their drive for relationship. Yep. They didn't want to offend. And the boys were literally halfway done <laughs> with their little right. activity because right. they wanted to get it done. Yeah. And the girls were frozen. And yeah. I was just like, wow, I had to share that with you. Men, task driven, right? Here's the project. Let's get it done. Girls, five or six of them, can't even figure out who do I partner with because I don't want to offend somebody, right? And I just sat there and said, this is brilliant. Because what it again emphasizes is God's design of who we are. First point in your notes, women are different from men in their perceptions, their communication, and their intimacy. Now, let's just talk about biology. There is a great book, and if you ever want to read it, a British geneticist by the name of Anne Moore. 
It's called brain sex. She says that the sexes are different because their brains are different. The brain, the chief administrative and emotional organ of life, is differently constructed in men and in women. It processes information in a different way, which results in different perceptions, priorities, and behaviors. Now, Biology 101. The right side of the brain controls visual and spatial functions, allowing us to understand abstractions and shapes and patterns, right? The right side sometimes is known as the creational part of who we are. The left side of the brain controls the verbal, linguistic, and concrete functions, allowing us to see and think about details and more practical things in a logical, orderly sequence. Science has proven that women have 40% more connections between both halves of the brain than do men. Okay, this is significant because if women have 40% more connections between the two halves in their brain, this defines a lot when it comes to our interrelationships with the opposite sex. These differences are important because this tells us the difference between sequential and asequential thinking. Men go A plus B plus C plus D equals E. They're sequenced. Women can go A plus B equals E. And we sit there and go, how, how did you get there? You, you, this is how men and women are wired differently. See, the male is at a great disadvantage. If emotions are uh, accessed on the right side of the brain and verbal functions are accessed on the left, men lack <laughs> the ability that women have more connections to put feelings into words. Do you see how this plays out? The language women speak is feeling and nuance and emotion. The language men speak is action and facts and sports and jobs. So what the doctor and more points out, she says that women cry more often than men, perhaps because they have more to cry out because they're receiving more emotional input, reacting more strongly to it and expressing it with greater force. Because that connection is so much more present in a woman than it is a man. Amen? Now we're getting it. Right? That's why women seem to have this sixth sense we call intuition. This is... For the relation woman, uh, for the relation woman, an event is important because she enters an event because it provides connection with another person, and a woman wants deep connection. And I'm going to tell you something. This is worth its weight in gold. What what men fear in their relationships is entrapment. Okay. What wi what men fear in relationship is this idea that I could be caught in a smothering relationship and then ultimately be humiliated by rejection and deceit. You know what women fear the most? Isolation. Women don't want to be alone. They fear, uh, their fears in standing out or being set apart by success and being all alone in their journey and not having another woman to share it with. Male identity is threatened by intimacy Female identity is threatened by separation. I'm going to tell you right now, when Lori and I were dating, we took a trip, we'll, and, and she knows the trip. We took a trip to California to go see some friends, right? And uh, I think we had broken up and gotten together back together uh, on that trip at least three times. It was a three time that in the car ride to California, <laughs> we broke up. And we got back together. We broke up. We got back together. You know, and it was this thing like, she's like, what do you want? And what, what, was my, what was my word to you? Yes. I know, I love it, <laughs> right? And so for me, I couldn't express, like, I just said, I said, I, I feel like I'm, I'm losing me in this, 
and I didn't know how to process that, right? And that was a memorable trip that then ultimately led to us getting married, and now 26 later, <laughs> years later, here we are, right? But the communication style is so much different than it is for women than it is for men. Women, conversations are negotiations to attempt or maintain closeness. For men, it's about power. It's about status. See, women use language to gain or maintain relationships. Men use language to either gain or maintain power or di gather or dispense information. So women have, in your notes, their brains organized and structured to facilitate relationships. Now the big question is, how does this affect sex? Because I knew you were all thinking about that. This is why, guys, listen clearly, the greatest sex organ on a woman is her brain. Think of it this way. Men approach the topic of sex like file folders. Job, relationship, hobbies, sport, and we've got everything filed. Women approach sex like the waves of an ocean. <laughs> right? Men can be like, okay, on to the next thing. We just did this, we can do this, you know, and it's just like, dun 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 dun, dun. Women, it's the looking out on the horizon and seeing the waves develop and just sit there and go, oh, look how it's building and building. And all of a sudden it comes crashing in on the shore, right? It's just, there's movement, there's fluidity. This is how, see, a, a woman needs to be romanticized. She needs to have the mind engaged. William Harley, psychologist, said this, for women, having sex is a decision more mental than physical. Amen? And so, why is language and relationship and communication so important? Because it brings an understanding and a bonding that though we may never fully understand the opposite sex, it is important for us to go, how do we leverage these relationships so that we can be better people in the process? Biblical example, Priscilla in the book of Acts. Priscilla had a husband named Aquila, and who knows what they named their kids, but you know that's another topic for another, another time. Um, they joined the Apostle Paul in the work of ministry. Now, here's the thing you need to understand about Priscilla. She was a relational woman because in Acts, we have enough about her that tells us she was relationally connected to the Word of God. She was relationally connected to the work of God. She was relationally connected to the world in which God had created. She was relationally connected to God's workers. We see this woman who in her marital context, and even if she wasn't married, I believe she would still be a force to be reckoned with in her understanding of my relationship with God and my relationship with other people is important because it fuels helping people get to know God and further the work of his ministry. Read about Priscilla, Acts chapter 16, 17, 18, right in there. But she is an incredible example of what we're describing here. Two more points rather quickly. Number five, wounded female. So, of course, along the journey comes woundedness. We talked about this with men. And men feel the woundedness because of the warrior inside each and every man who has to learn as he matures, what do you fight for and what do you not fight for? How do you, how do you uh, account for your losses? How do you account for your hurt? And most men today are stuck in that wounded stage of, of masculinity, hence some of the societal things going on right now. For women, again, the woundedness comes because it is a reality that life is primarily made up of continually letting go, leaving, and losses. Because the investment she has on, in a husband with a marriage the Bible talks about widows more than we would ever, ever imagine. Because God puts a premium on the fact that, number one, women live longer than men. <laughs> number two, that there is incredible cultural care that needs to be extended to a widow who loses her husband, who oftentimes is the primary breadwinner, who is the provider for the family, right? And so there's incredible biblical counsels for how we take care of a woman who has lost her husband. But there's the letting go of the children that we have children for a while and then we have to let them go and release them. And so for a woman, this is where wounding happens. And yet it also happens in other areas. I mean, I think about our journey together as a married couple. One of the toughest parts of our lives was, was dealing with the topic of, of infertility. 
the fact that we both wanted kids and for nine plus years had to wrestle with God because we could not get pregnant. And I'm going to tell you right now, for me, I learned a lot about compassion and I learned a lot about empathy and I learned a lot about just coming alongside of my wife and for I, I, not even fully understanding because I could never fully understand what it must mean in her mind to not be able to bring forth life. Again, she's been created anatomically different than me, and yet there's this desire that seems to go unfulfilled. How do you wrestle with God over these things? And so for me to come alongside of her and journey with her in this, I think some of the greatest things that happened in that that time was not only wrestling with God, where sometimes you just shout out to God and you curse at God and you're frustrated with God, and let me just tell you, my God's big enough to handle those things. It's okay to shake your fists at God. It's okay to get angry with God. But don't just stay in that. That just gets messy. You've got you to come to some resolution. And for her, for me to tell my wife that I was perfectly fine if we never had children because it just meant we would be freed up to do ministry as a couple that wouldn't have to be concerned about children back home. That was, and for her to hear her husband say that was an incredible part in our, our early marriage state. You know, the fact that we did get pregnant at one time and she miscarried and the fact that I'm grieving with her in our home because there was that there was that taste, right, of like, oh, we're pregnant, and all of a sudden it's gone. And you're wrestling with that, right? And all of a sudden now, okay, your body's doing something it was created to do, but it's not having that fruitful end that we hope for. And then all of a sudden, you know, nine plus years later, we get babies. And it's like, what? And we've gone through this journey where we have to understand that, you know, Women get wounded from things like this, and yet there's incredible healing in it. We have three kids now that we were able to have biologically. And then the conversation was, do we have more kids? And she's looking at me going, nope, you're going to get six. I'm like, okay, you know. So now I have to walk around with a cone of shame on my head and all that stuff. So, But also, too, navigating the fact that her, you know, her mom, she wasn't in my life when my mom passed away when I was 15. But with her mother getting colorectal cancer and now journeying with a woman who's very close to her mother. And how do I navigate this road with her? Because she's grieving, you know, at one point in our, our marriage, this, this idea that she can't do what God has created her to do. And now she has this relationship with this most important woman in her life. And we have to journey through this together. There's incredible woundedness that happens with this. Kind of like Ruth. If you look at the Old Testament character Ruth. Uh, her her mother-in-law, Naomi, specifically. Look what it says in Ruth chapter 1. This is a woman who has lost her husband and her, her kids, her boys. And she says to them, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, which literally means bitter. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. Has anyone ever felt like that? Really, I go do this and I come back with nothing? Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity on me? And what's powerful about the four chapters we have with Ruth is that she journeys with her mother-in-law and ultimately finds favor with this farmer named Boaz. And all of a sudden now, worth and significance and value comes back into her life simply because she's in relationship. Yes, she's lost a husband. Yes, she's lost boys. But the fact that her daughter-in-law continues to persevere in relationship with her brings her healing. This is why Corinthians, 2 Corinthians is such a powerful uh, chapter. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, write it down for later. God's strength is made perfect in our weakness. And perhaps this is the, the point that God wants women to know on their, their feminine journey is this, is that there is a unique strength that comes to us in our weakness by means of God's grace. And that's what we lean upon. And so this is true for a widow. This is for a woman who loses her children. This is for a woman who experiences unmet expectations or childhood trauma. Let me just tell you, this is also true for a woman who experiences sexual abuse. The Me Too movement. I tell you, this is a, this is a shout out to our culture to come alongside of each other and say, okay, how, can we, how does God want to bring healing to this? That we need to create a community and a family and a culture that says those actions from powerful and abusive men, oftentimes, generally speaking, are not acceptable. How can now we journey together and we try to understand each other's journey and pursue the healing that Christ has for every single one of us? Ladies, I, I, I pray 
for you. I want you to know that this is a place where we can come together and gather up. And, and if there's something you need as far as uh, a, a mentor, there's women here who have been through that who have found the healing in Christ and they want to pass that on to somebody who desperately needs it as well. Amen? Amen. That there is healing found in the hands of God. And so when it comes to being wounded, whether we're talking about sexual abuse or divorce or unemployment or what have you, God offers the same message he has sent to, to men and women for ages. In your weakness, find that my strength is perfect. And so, last point is the, the strong female. And this is literally a, a woman of strength. Two, uh, three blanks right here. That a woman's wisdom is a wisdom born in pain. A woman's wisdom is a wisdom born in relationship or, or developed in relationship. And ultimately, a woman's wisdom is a wisdom that is Trusting in Christ. Let me close with an interesting illustration of a woman by the name of Audrey Hepburn. Aw, she's great, isn't she? Here's the thing about her that was so unique. You know, she was born in Hungary. Her family had to escape World War II. She came here. She came out uh, an actress. She was in such movies as Breakfast at Tiffany's and Roman Holiday, right? Yet there was something within Audrey Hepburn that was continually unsettled, even as she was this, this Hollywood star. This, she, was, she was the epitome of glamour and grace. She was a woman that had a mother invest in her and tell her, you are more valuable than just how you look. In her own autobiography, she says this, I came from a home, a mother who taught me first and foremost that I am secondary to other people. Can you imagine going up at home where your mom says, everyone else is more important than you? And what are we telling our kids these days, right? Like, oh, you're the most important thing in the world. You're the, the universe revolves around you, right? All those things. She comes from a home where her mom says, you are secondary to other people. Service to others is what gives us meaning for ourselves. In the motion picture business, it is easy to forget your ideals. But I got out of the business, didn't do anything for a while, and had a lot of time to reflect on what I believed. Audrey Hepburn says this, I came down to the fact that I honored in my heart what my mother taught me. It was time to say yes to UNICEF. And I thank God now for I had this film career and it made it me to, uh, to be well known because it's now clear to me that the reason I got famous all those years ago was to have this career and now a new career, the ability to do something, a small thing to help people. And you know what she did after that? She visited over 125 countries, Somalia, Vietnam, Bangladesh. She was awarded a unique award, an honorary award from President Bush in the early 90s. This is a woman who said, I exist to help people become better. She had her trials, she had her difficulty, and yet she was poised in such a way to make her world a better place. This is a woman of strength. Right now, for those of you on the journey of, of biblical femininity, this is the goal, right? To learn from our pain for those that our lives to be developed in relationship, but ultimately for you. And again, I don't know where Audrey Hepburn was spiritually, but for you to continue to put your hope in Christ, your trust in him. And what is a strong woman? The Proverbs 31 woman. And I'm going to tell you, ladies. Read it this week, meditate on it, because here's what you find in Proverbs 31, starting at verse 10. is a woman that not only had a marriage and had children, her significance and dignity and identity was not found there. She was a woman who feared the Lord, who had a business of her own, had employees that she managed. They loved her. Why? Because women make great leaders. She has this business, and the Bible says in Proverbs 31, she extended her hand to the poor, she helped the needy, her husband praises her. Her children are thankful for her. And all in all, this is a woman who understood who she was simply because she was created in the image of God. And she leveraged her relationships to bring glory to him. That is a woman of strength. Amen? Make yourselves women of strength by seizing upon these things that God has uniquely wired you to do. Bring glory to him. And I'm going to tell you what, you're going to find satisfaction in life. Six messages rolled up into one, just like last week. 
next week, uh, real quick, you want to add anything? Is it good? Okay, good. I don't have to sleep on the couch tonight. Yeah! Oceans, right? Yeah, all right, all right. Um, speaking of, next Sunday, parents, FYI, very important conversation on human sexuality. So that's going to be next week. How do we understand ourselves as sexual creatures and how do we understand our culture that tends to be sexually confused? We're going to navigate that next week. It's going to be difficult material. Pray for me. But for those of you that have young kids that usually sit in service, you may want to think about having them back in the kids' classroom next Sunday. Amen? Let's stand. Let's pray. Oh, Father, you are, you are good. You are so good to us. You, you're, you are I- incredibly awesome in the fact that you've given us minds to even comprehend some of the things we've talked about, even though maybe some of us don't fully understand things about the opposite sex. But Lord, what's amazing is you've, you've called us to be a community and you've called us to live in figuring out how do we complement one another as male and female. And Lord, I pray that You've been glorified as we've talked about the the male journey. I pray that you've been glorified as we've talked about the female journey. And I'm sure there's tons of stuff we've left out. But Lord, as long as we understand the general blueprint for how you've wired us, may we live, all of us, for your glory. May we live looking for opportunities to share the name of Jesus to people because in him is healing for, for all things. That we live in a way that understands the kingdom of God as the most important to invest our lives in. So, Lord, whether we're men, whether we're women, may we come together, find healing in the name of Christ, and yet find strength and power as we pursue the things of Christ together. Because we are stronger together than we could ever be apart. So thanks again, God, for this morning. Thanks for loving us in Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace and mercy forever and ever. Amen. Have a great week, all right? Yeah.